All right, everyone's here from the keynote, right? So instead of being lazy, let's be crazy now. Um, so a brief introduction of me. Um, Caprico is my handle. Um, you can call me Nate as well. Um, I am a senior offensive security practitioner um, for uh, Brillet. I'll get into them a little bit more later. Um, I'm a former podcast contributor to um, these guys here. Um, been doing that for a while, and then you know you get a job, you have more time for or less time for that, and more time for podcasting. So what the talk's going to look like is first, I'm going to say, well, what do I mean by when I say report like you're crazy? What do I actually mean by crazy? And then after that, we'll go through three different scenarios that kind of come off of that mindset um, that I've done. Uh, made reports for in the past. Um, they're all non-specific and generic and kind of no, one's, no names are out there, so I'm not giving you guys information that, I mean, you could probably, after this, figure out who it is, but, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So what do I mean by crazy? What's the number one thing that we write in our reports for offensive or just defensive? Like, we're looking at vulnerabilities, right? We're looking at the numbers. We're looking at CVSS scores. We're looking at, hey, is it a critical, medium, high, low, whatever. Um, so I always had put this out there when I first started. Hey, if we get a CVSS score, like an average of an 8.9 for a client, that's considered high under their standards for CVSS. But if there's a tenth of a percent more, they're critical, right? It, there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. It doesn't really tell us the whole story. And a lot of the times I would see clients or just other um, pen testers get stuck in this number crunch to determine risk. It's like, well, we only have a seven. It's like, well, that seven also includes SMB signing not be being required. There's a whole other attack that's available there. So as I started to go kind of away from pen testing for a bit and started doing OSIN investigations for a while, um, I said, well, what if we thought up of some crazy ideas of how vulnerabilities in the context of the information that we have would affect an organization? And basically what that means is how crazy of a story can I make like a D&D &D campaign kind of encounter to make it sound like this vulnerability will screw you up? Like big bad guy dragon comes in and all hell breaks loose, but it's because you have SSL vulnerability on the external. Like small C, big story. Um, generic uh, talker presenter quote, the but it it fits. It's I was trying to say it's like well if I'm gonna be crazy. I have to make sure that I'm not wrong. So, of course, it sounds like I'm going to make something crazy. That doesn't mean that it's wrong to say that. Um, so, in the talk, we're going to go over three scenarios that I've actually written up um, for different clients and kind of the methods to get there or the mindset to get there. So, the first one is called Operation Your Mine. Um, we had a OSIN investigation where we had a law firm in Africa. Um, we were supposed to get all of their tech stack, all of their external stuff, figure out what internal tools they may be using via OSINT, and then also look at their personnel. Their personnel specifically was a bunch of lawyers, who knew, law firm, lawyers. Um, <laughs> they were specializing in mineral extraction law, or a couple of them were, and that's important uh, later in the story here. So what, what do we do? Uh, we looked at their tech stack. It's a tech stack in Africa. Yeah, it's pretty minimal. Um, nothing a lot there. Zero vulnerabilities looked like it was pretty much patched up. Um, there weren't many services. Their web apps looked fine. Looked at their socials of every single lawyer at the firm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. We found all of that. Nothing really stood out. We didn't find anybody embezzling or doing anything like super nefarious or whatever. And then here's my, to go off of Tim from the keynote, Here's my lazy hack, and it is what I call the holy grail of OSINT. If you take a company's name or their company email or a person's name and type file type colon PDF into Google, it searches all PDFs that Google has ever indexed to see if that name or email or whatever shows up in that PDF file. So I ran that, 
And I found out that there was this massive, massive mining project for graphite that one of the lawyers was the notarizer on. And it was between two multi-billion dollar mining corporations, one of which being out in the European Union, and they were pretty international, and one they were selling that project over to the Indian corporations. I'm not kidding when I say the gover or the dollar amounts are it was a lot of because graphite, and for those that don't know, graphite's one of the main components in um, all the lithium ion batteries that are going into cars. So a lot of people were wanting to get mining rights to that so that they could you know, be a part of that supply chain. Um, but in this document, I read the whole thing. It was like 120 pages. Greatest reading material ever. Uh, the problem was that I found was that not only were emails in there for the lawyer, but there were emails in there for every single board of director from either company and every single C-suite member from either one of those companies. So then I was like, well, okay, well, what, what do I do with this information and how do I like show a threat here? And I proposed this, and this is a very dumbed down version of it because I had like names, like who's the accountant at this other place and whatever. Um, so my first thing, I'm going to fish the lawyer. I'm going to impersonate that lawyer now for the rest of it. And then I said, okay, cool. Once I get into his email, we can then impersonate him to fish all of the board members to say, hey, we have some updates on this PDF and this new contract because this new law came out in this in country in Africa. And here's the PDF of all those details. Boom. Okay, cool. That PDF's got a malicious payload into it that talks back to my C2. Boom, 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 I'm inside both of those networks and then can pretty much do whatever I want. Create a wire fraud, uh, ran hold them for ransom, have someone else do the ransomware attack, like things like that. I wrote all of this out in my report. I even had it to the point of like, I found every single personnel or person in the European uh, mining company <laughs> that would be required to sign off on a wire transfer of over a million dollars <laughs> to the point of like, yeah, okay, I'm writing that down. And I graphed it all out similar to this with people and names and whatever. And I did it for the Indian company as well. So after you impersonate him to fish board of directors, it flips to either company. So the client didn't talk to us for like two to four weeks after that, after that report was given. And I thought I had just lost us a client for writing that into a report. But instead they came back and said, uh, they took it very seriously and they actually found multiple vulnerabilities inside the internal network and they found more documents that were in there just left unsecured for this deal. It was, it was bad and they were like, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. To which reading that email, I was like, oh no. <laughs> just no, I don't, don't, uh, okay. So then it was a huge success on that report and my boss was like, okay, you're gonna do this again. Um, so for context, I want to see who knows how wine's made. Complete change of pace here. Who knows how wine's made? Okay. In general, these are kind of the things that you need to do and that need, and you need to have to make wine. You need soil to plant in. You need specific grapes. You need to harvest, crush, ferment, barrel, age, bottle, sell. Okay, cool. There's the loop of wine making. We're going to focus on this uh, for the context here, the actual soil. Reason for that, I got off work one day and my wife was watching this video of this video game, or it was this wine making tycoon game. And I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. And one of the features of it was you had different soil types that were going to be, you know, better for making a Chardonnay, a Merlot, a whatever. I'm not a wine guy, that's the only ones that I know. Um, Cab, Cabernet, Shiraz. Okay, now I guess I know. I've been hanging out too much with my wife. Um, that's not a bad thing. Um, so then we got a client right afterwards, or like a couple weeks later, and it was a winery. So I'm like, oh, cool. This is kind of interesting. And it was personnel that we were given to look at, a bunch of salespeople, distributors, truck drivers, contractors. Um, we did the exact same thing for the African uh, lawyer firm. We looked at all their vulnerabilities that were out there. Nothing great. It was a bunch of SSL, V2, V3, whatever. That wasn't too much there. We looked at their socials. You know, no one's like selling wine on the side or being like, hey, the company's really bad. Like, no one's going out and saying, it's like, hey, if you were to like walk into this room at this night, there's free wine or something like that. Um, 
So nothing really stood out. So I go, okay, cool, holy grail time. Let's try this again. And I found a PDF that looks similar to this. And for those of you that haven't taken, oh, what, what's the course now? Geography or geology in, since high school. This is a pH, or basically just a pH metering map. So when you do, do a soil test for planting or farming, anything, a lot of times we'll do a soil test to see, hey, how good is the soil? Is there any sort of areas that we need to worry about? Um, and it basically either looks like this or it'll look like a paint by numbers on how the pH level looks. And I found on their website, in their WordPress website, buried in a link somewhere, was a map that literally looked like paint by the numbers of all their fields and what their pH level is at for the entire field. So it was like 8.5, 6.5, 7.3 or whatever. So what does that mean and what, do you, what can you do for that? Well, due to looking at the actual field from Google Maps and satellite images, we were able to see, oh, they've got automated irrigation systems all over the place. They've got this big central spot at their warehouse there. So I went, oh, okay, cool. So what if we like geolocated to a bunch of IPs that are in their system there? I'm not kidding you, and this is the most terrible thing to ever do. Do not put PLCs on the internet with the port open to the internet. Clicked, looked at it, yep, and called them immediately and said, hey, this was out there. Um, turn it off now because we were able to see like exact pH levels to going out to every single field. Um, and so it, when we went into the report, we said we can either physically go there and start screwing with like dials and knobs and whatever, or we could have just done, you know, looked at the OT network like we did and then, you know, sabotage that soil that way. For fun, I went. I'm gonna to go to Amazon and buy a bunch of lye, which on the pH scale, there's on the pH scale you have zero and 14. Lye or caustic soda or whatever is 14, so it's the highest concentration you can have. I was like, I'm gonna hire my buddy to, that knows how to fly, and we're gonna take a cargo plane and then just dump that over all their fields. Instantly, like, would screw up any sort of soil testing. It would cost them millions of dollars to get that back. And then if they were publicly traded, which I believe they were, I was like, okay, cool. So then we just short the stock when that age comes out or just hold us short for forever and then we make a bunch of money. Sounds like a good idea. It's not the weirdest thing in the world, but you can go like that. To which, like I already said, they were like, oh, okay, yeah, this is really, really bad. We tighten up all of our physical security. We've got all the irrigation stuff now talking not to the external internet. This is great. And they looked at the plane one and they went, yeah, we have no idea how we would address that one. And I'm like, you really can't. But I was like, they bought the plane thing though. <laughs> they bought it. It's going to be funny. Uh, but then uh, actually those two uh, reports really got, uh, caught the eye of uh, another uh, person that I was working with who eventually went to a different company and I now work with him at the same spot. So I am now working for a, uh, electric cooper or a subsidiary of an electric cooperative. And what electric cooperatives are is think of it as like your farming cooperative, they're non for profit. Um, but a key note here is that electric cooperatives cover about 50% of all the land mass of the United States. So you have like your average mer that's like gonna get your major cities and stuff like that, or your major metropolitan areas. But then the rest of the rural areas of the United States, those are gonna be your electric cooperatives and stuff like that, or even in some major cities. Like for me in Houston, I've got an electric cooperative that runs a bunch of stuff. Um, so as we were talking, like pre-hire, like try and build out the job and figure something out, um, he asked, uh, what are the biggest threats do you see to the grid in general? And I went, oh, and by the way, the title of this one was Lights Out with, with a 22. Um, for, so I said, okay, so here are the three threats that I see, like top threats. Russian state-sponsored hackers with the ability to disrupt OT controllers. Basically, what they've been doing in the Ukraine since 2020, or 2020, 2014. Holy cow, I haven't been able to say 2014 today. Um, basically, the lights out stuff that they've been able to do where they go into a substation, they go into the power plants, and they just start flipping switches to see which one turns everything off and just full disruption. 
Um, set ransomware. Biggest thing is like, if they fish and get in, I know this is antiquated infrastructure that's probably on defaults for every single Active Directory default that you can probably have ever seen exploited anywhere. It's like, they all have tools for this. So if they get in, ransomware actors are gonna be the next thing. And then the third one and the most weird one that I came up with with him, I said, well, what if I just went to a substation and I just like shot out the cooling fans real quick? And he's like, that would be really bad. And I'm like, yeah, that would be really bad, right? Because, and I'll get into why later, but what was funny is I didn't even guess how really bad it was. It happened a week later. Uh, some guy back in uh, March, April of this, wait, January, February, February of this year, went out into North Carolina and just shot out some transformer on a substation, created this huge arc fire that firefighters were battling for like four days, and then they had to set up a mobile um, substation to like reroute all the power until they could fix it and all this other stuff. And I was like, okay, well, now I get to explain how this works. So why does this work? Well, if you look at any sort of substation as you're going by it, you're gonna see these massive cooling fans, right? Those cooling fans are set up to cool what is called um, uh, galvanized steel, where it actually has like magnetized strips through it. So they have a neutral strip and then they have a magnetized strip. And if you put a hole where two of those magnetized strips meet and then also add a bunch of heat to it, the electricity will actually power its way through that heat through a positive charge and then just explode out until it finds ground because there's so much high voltage there. So if you just like either nick one of those fins or take out one of those fans and let it get too hot, boom. Um, why does it work? Or why did this work in the first place for this? Um, substations are in remote areas. I don't think you want to be living next to a substation because one, high voltage, and two, it's kind of loud um, because all you're hearing is just high voltage the entire time. Um, due to um, just environmental easements, um, there's a plethora of cover for around these things. So whoever, uh, they never caught that guy. Um, whoever did it, they were able to just hide inside of like foliage or inside the woods that was right next to it and just pop shots from there. Um, and also physical security is lacking. I don't know anybody who is in, as a security guard would be like, oh yeah, no, I wanna go and like patrol a high voltage thing where if I walk the wrong way, I could probably kill myself. This is, this is great. I love this job. Um, but it is what it is. Um, there's a lot of people that, there was a company out in Idaho that said, oh, we've got the solution for this. And they basically took like a tank style approach where they basically just made four inch thick steel covers for it that makes it look like a bunker from four, like Warhammer 40K oh, that just goes like slips right over these transformers. And we're like, yeah, that's cool. But how much does that cost? About a lot. <laughs> And it's like, okay, fine. And this wasn't the only planned attack either. That, that one in North Carolina was planned. The one um, here that did get caught, there were like 12 people, and this was like an hour away from me that this happened earlier this year as well, um, where they had like 12 people ready to go and do the exact same thing. Um, but then I, my boss asked after that happened, I, he said, well, what would you do better? And I'm like, or what can you do better? And I'm like, well, we've already been doing it for forever. We've already been thinking like this. There's a great talk by Chris Rock, um, not the comedian that got slapped on stage. Um, he's an Australian guy. Um, he runs a seam monster. He did a talk called uh, How to Overthrow a Government at DEF CON 24. It's one of my favorite talks. Um, one of the parts of his um, talk, he goes over you know, how do we get, you know, how do we disrupt power? How do we disrupt water and electricity and all that stuff? And part of that caption says, I don't have C4, but I have a bike frame, two table saws and a drill and a drone. Meet Mr. Choppy. <laughs> yeah, if that's not stealing jokes, I don't know what is. Um, Anyway, so I, I put this up here to say it's like, okay, cool, if I'm gonna do this now, I'm not gonna be anywhere near a substation. I'm gonna just send a drone in. We've already seen 
in the in the past year how effective drones are just in modern combat and also just you know they're getting super advanced whereas like five years ago it was like cool a dgi and accessible a dgi drone still is expensive it, it was like three grand or something like that for a really good one if not more but now you can wire up one for like 150 bucks and then just throw it up throw it away and throw it at anything you want um so he said, well, what, what's the other thing on, like, yeah, you can use drones, or you can do this. And I'm like, well, okay, so here's the other thing. I would actually target these instead, not the big substations. I would target these first. So on your poles, you have three transformers that are up on there. A lot of times you'll just see one or two, depending on how densely populated of an area that the pole is located. And I was like, these cause specific outages. Basically what this does is you have your hotline that goes from the high voltage that's supplied by the substation after it gets power from whatever power um, producer that you're getting it through. And then it'll go into those transformers and basically bring it to your house. So those step it down from high voltage down to like usable like 122.40 volt. So I was like, well, okay, so if I get five guys together and I go and say, let, let's just, since we're in Kansas City, I go to every, I go in like a five, ten block radius and I've got all five guys looking at different poles and I sync up and say, okay, cool, take all these out real quick. Boom, 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 the power goes out for like all 20 blocks. Okay, power company sends out a bunch of guys. Um, they get diverted away from larger substations that may be affected, that may be out in the middle of nowhere. And then I've already got my drone over there to say, okay, cool, boop, done. Drone, just drop something or cut lines or do whatever and make an explosion there. Boom, done. We don't know what happens at that point, but I do know that, and there is a lot of research behind this, that if power is out for more than three days, mass hysteria goes in to effect. Because you don't, a lot of places won't get water, a lot of places won't get gas. So heating, cooling, food gets to be to a point of no return. Um, anything that's refrigerated. I know I'm a real bummer after the first the keynote. Um, another bummer is is that this is super effective because those transformers, those smaller transformers, not the bigger transformers, the smaller transformers have been on back order from suppliers in the United States to, or just internationally for over a year. There are people and cooperatives out there that are still waiting on stuff they ordered a year ago. And so that was the, the main thing that I said. I was like, okay, cool. So the other thing that we could do is we could just disrupt all of these supply lines or just, you know, there's a lot of, it's like physical attack or um, operationally, it's kind of a, a lose-lose scenario here. Well, one of the things that we started implementing for us at um, the cooperative, we started saying, okay, we have a culture of we want to help our members or their customers. And I said, that's great. We need to help ourselves first before we can do any of that. And when I say I literally just ripped into every single vulnerability that they had my first day and also probably got DA within five minutes of me getting my work computer, it happened, and then they said, okay, well, how do we fix it? And then just build up from there. So it's more of just these things, you want to give them the worst case, they asked what the worst case scenario was, and I gave them exactly what I told you, and they're like, okay, you have our attention now. So now you all think I look like this right now. It's Pepe Silvia. Um, but what are the takeaways that I wanted to bring away from this? As hackers in general, offensive, defensive, whatever, we can see writing, we get to see writing on the walls that is stuff that people aren't going to look for or other people aren't going to look for. Your accounting person's not going to see, hey, exchange on prem is external to the internet or something like that. You're going to be able to see different things of like, hey, we're getting stuff at like 12 a.m. Why is Bill from accounting? logging in at 3 a.m. on vacation right now or something like that. We're able to see that. We're able to look and correctly see, hey, and we're also able to read. We're the ones that look at all the breach notifications. We're seeing all the different articles. We're able to see, okay, 
this actor uses this, this actor uses this, and has these methods. We can then build up around that and figure out, okay, what's our worst case scenario as a company? You have that internal context as an employee or as just an attacker that's looking at their company in general. And as ethical hackers, it's our job to correctly and effectively convey threats and risks to organizations, whether they're going to like it or not. Um, because I've had a lot of places that have said, and I know this has happened, I'll give the report to whoever our point of contact is, and it's like, I know he's changing stuff onto it. There's no way that he's getting away with this as to a CEO. And it's like, okay, that's, that's fine and everything, but it's better that I have sounded crazy to get a point across of like, hey, this is really bad. This could lead to this crazy scenario or something like that. Then I have not said anything at all because what's the worst thing that you can do ever? Not say something that exists. So if there is a problem, not saying a problem exists is almost as bad as hitting enter on the, the keyboard. Anyway, that's my um, talk. Hope everyone enjoyed it. And did I get us back on time?